All right. Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to see you. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. Good Lord, hasn't politics aged me? <laughs> Crikey. But I'm so glad that when I woke up this morning, I didn't choose the blue hairspray that was so upsetting for Rafe. Goodness me, that would have been terrible. Um, uh, what a world we live in. Rafe, I thought that was a fantastic exposition of what is required. And I was so delighted that he continued to use the word reform. I promise you I hadn't paid him anything. Um, but I'll come on to that in a second. I just want you to think about the word, the number 70. 70. So here we are, 2024. We've got the highest taxes in 70 years. We've got the highest government spending in 70 years. We've got the longest waiting lists since records began over 70 years ago. The national debt is the highest for 70 years. We're in the lowest growth decade for 70 years. And here's the big one. We're in the longest recession per person, and that's what matters, for 70 years. And that, after 14 years of government under the Conservatives, it's a catastrophe. Absolute catastrophe. If we don't start growing our economy, we are doomed. It is that serious. But don't worry, it's all fine. Sir Keir has all the answers. I call it Starmageddon. It's a risk near us in 2024. Because the truth is actually there's no difference between the two main parties. If you think that the Labour Party is going to change any of those key things with regard to taxes, with regard to government spending, then you're grossly mistaken. And the reason we've got the longest recession per person is because of mass immigration. So if the economy is flatlining, which it is at the moment, dear old Jeremy Hunt, he gets excited. He gets really excited if we grow at 0.2 of 1%, for heaven's sake. I'm old enough to remember the 80s and 90s when we would grow at 2.5 to 3.5%. We got anxious if it was less than 2%. Anything less than 1% was a moral recession. With immigration levels where it is, over a million arriving every year, a city the size of Birmingham, unless the economy grows by about 1.2, 1.3%, we will continue to be in a recession per person. Our deficit at the moment this year will be about 120 billion quid. That's two and a half grand per person. Five grand for a couple. Added to the national debt. With no growth, the bond markets will not tolerate this over the next electoral cycle. Unless something significant changes, we are heading towards bankruptcy within one electoral cycle. It is that serious and no one is waking up to it. How's this happened for heaven's sake? I mean, we've got the experts that we should rely on, our lovely friends at the Treasury. They know what they're doing. Then there's the Bank of England. I mean, does he know what he's doing? You've got the OBR, you've got the ONS, the IMF. All these people, they've told us how to run our country. The politicians have listened. And we're ending up in the state that I've just referred to. Financially, the worst we've been in 70 years. Not to mention culturally that I'll come on to. The reality is that Britain is broken. It's never been in such a state. Nothing works. And unless we change course, things will get worse. Can we change course, you say, or is it too late? I'm going to have a show of hands and I want you to be honest. Don't think about it. How many of you know someone who's either left or leaving the country? Hands up. There you are, probably about a third. A similar number to those uh, when I asked the question on Wednesday night to an audience as well. What a shocking state of affairs. People feel that it's too late. It's not. Here's the thing. A great company run by a bad chief exec, can be ruined in a couple of years. But the reverse is true. A good chief exec can turn around 
a company that's in trouble in two to three years. That is what we have to hold hope for, because that is doable. It's achievable. What do we need to do that? Well, the first thing you've got to have is courage. You've got to have courage. And leadership is difficult. It requires courage. It requires difficult decisions. And sometimes you're going to get a bit of abuse and a bit of grief. But we have to reform the way that everything is done. Now, whenever the general election is, we'll be ready. We're standing everywhere. On our website, there's a contract, uh, which is about 30 pages long, which sets out our reforms. I'll just pick out a few key things. We need strong leadership to have a strong economy. For too many people, work doesn't pay. We've got to make work pay. Sunak woke up yesterday and he suddenly realised there are too many people on the benefit system. He's been around for quite some time. The Tories have been in charge for 14 years. I've been banging on about this for two years. You've got to make work pay. You've got to lift the starting point, which anybody pays any income tax, from 12 and a half grand to 20 grand. Net, that's 30 quid a week. That makes a real difference for many people trapped on the cycle of benefits. One in, out, one in eight of working age adults is on out of work benefits. You know you've got a problem when a taxi driver says, I'm better off at the end of the week driving 16 hours a week, claiming back pain for the remaining 26 hours a week, than if I drove for 40 hours a week. Sunak's just woken up. Great. The next thing we need is we need to be ambitious on healthcare. I mean, waiting lists the longest for 70 years. We're the only party that says we can get to zero waiting lists. We had a press conference last week. It's doable, not easy but it's doable. We allocate how you do it, we allocate the money that's required, but what you shouldn't be doing is giving it to bungling NHS bureaucrats. The more money you give them, the more money they will waste. You've got to fundamentally reform the way we do healthcare in this country. And this will be the first general election when any political party has the courage to set out a different way of doing things. I don't want any of this pathetic nonsense, 24 hours to save the NHS, <laughs> For God's sake, it's way more serious than that. I was at a campaign event on Tuesday night, uh, Monday night. 75-year-old gentleman said, my wife had a fall. It took eight hours for the ambulance to come. She was on the floor for eight hours. But A&E was closed. This is the same hospital that proudly announced the 21 flags of 21 different genders. Maybe if they focused on actually curing patients rather than the number of genders there are out there, things might be a bit better. So we could get to zero waiting lists and we need to have that debate in this election campaign. The third thing is we've got to have the courage to say that actually mass immigration has failed this country. By the way, no one voted for it. I mean... I don't remember a referendum saying, do we want mass immigration, yes or no? Maybe I, was, maybe I was sort of forgetful, but no one voted for it. But that's what we've got. So what we've got to have is we've got to say, we need to freeze immigration. One in, one out. Now, you could be smart about this, because about 400,000 people leave every year, so we can welcome 400,000 highly qualified, highly skilled people, preferably at or above the average national wage, that will work a treat. Smart immigration, not mass immigration. We're the only party with a clear plan that will stop the boats. Sunak pledged, stop the boats. 6,000 people later this year alone, and tragically, at least 10 that we know about have died this year. The kind and compassionate policy on the boats is to safely pick up, but instead of bringing them to Dover, you take them back to Dunkirk. We're legally entitled to do it. We're the only party with the leadership and the courage to call it out and say that's what should happen. That will stop the boats. That will keep people alive. So we've got a strong leadership on immigration. Defence is another key area where we actually, and in a sense, because of the dangerous political world that we now live in, the geopolitical world, We've got to have strong defence. 
We've got to get to 3% of GDP within six years. It's doable. Our contract sets out how you do it. Dear old Grant Shapps the other day, he had some fun. He went on a test firing. Did you hear this? Thought he'd go and see the brilliance of this missile that the MOD said would work. He pressed the button. Up went the missile. Plop! It got about as far as you can throw a cricket ball. I mean, seriously, that's the state of our armed forces under this lot. So we've got to reform the way procurement is done, the way things are managed. And we've got to be strong on law and order. And we've got to have the courage to have strong leaders. The best leaders of police forces, frankly, would be former officers from the military. That's what used to happen about 70 years ago, funnily enough. But now, instead, we've got Sir Mark Rowley, who thinks it's a good idea to allow pro-Hamas marches week in, week out. I was the first person, one of the first, on October the 11th, to call for these marches to be banned. And if they had been banned, as they did in France, we wouldn't be where we are today. The idea... The idea that our friends in the Jewish community cannot walk down the streets of London for fear of being threatened is shameful on us all. But most of all, it's shameful on the boss of the Met Police, the Mayor of London who could also stop this, the Home Secretary who could stop this, and the Prime Minister who could stop this. Absolutely shameful. <laughs> and there's something that's very dear to the heart of, of course, uh, this great organisation, is we've got to be strong on cultural leadership. We actually need to shout from the very rooftops about our pride in our culture, who we are, where we've come from, our incredible history, our amazing achievements. When you think of what we gave the world, the Industrial Revolution, Shakespeare, Elgar, all these great things. We actually gave the world the internet for free. It's probably a dumb, duff deal, wasn't it? Um, and all sorts of other things. And most importantly of all, we gave the world James Bond. <laughs> so we should be shouting that from the rooftops. It's amazing, actually, in the world of diversity, equality and inclusion that I know you all love, that we're allowed to be here today. I mean, on Tuesday in Brussels, the mayor of Brussels said, no, 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 you can't, have, you can't have a debate in a conference if you think the wrong way. I mean, it's remarkable that there's not the, the mayor of London's sphincter police outside. Maybe we should be grateful to Mayor Khan for allowing us to have this. Also, it's amazing, <clears throat> we're, we're in this church for the whole day, Peter. I know. I mean, maybe you should split it, like a quarter of a day in a temple a quarter of a day in a mosque, a quarter of a day in a tent to satisfy the religion of the eco-zealots, and then a quarter of the day in a church. I mean, you, know I mean? you need to get a grip. You've got to get with this DI stuff. You know? yeah, yeah. Seriously, this great country of ours, its foundation is Christianity. And look, we welcome people from all faiths, but there has to be a recognition, a respect, and an appreciation for that foundation of Christianity. Rafe touched on what happened in Michaela School. <laughs> what happened in Michaela School was a defining moment, absolutely defining moment. The judge made the right decision. Here's where we're at, though. The mother of that child, and this is a school of multiple faiths, multiple face and the way the head runs it is said actually for the unity of the whole every faith has to make a compromise and actually the way this country should work is that we celebrate and we operate under the umbrella of a single <coughs> British culture that's who we are that's where we've come from multiculturalism living in silos doesn't work we've seen it we know it and sadly we hear it on the streets every week that is the reality. That mother has, spent over, has, has cost over half a million pounds of taxpayers' funds, half a million quid, in order for her child
to have the right to have a prayer room. Here's the interesting thing. This child was no angel. It's public information I'm about to reveal. It's on the judgment. This is a child that was excluded for five days for threatening to stab another pupil. Which the mother repealed. I mean, I'm pretty sure when we send our children to school, we'd rather that they weren't being threatened to stab, let alone possibly stabbed, if it's okay with you. This is the world we've got to, but it requires leadership and courage to call it out. Truly unbelievable. But I think that actually with strong leadership, we can still turn this round. It's not easy, but we've got to do it. Because otherwise, frankly, this country is in dire straits. And then there's the other thing in schools that's going on at the moment. I mean, today's Saturday, whichever pronoun or gender you want today. Given the current state of affairs, Peter, you can change it on Monday. And then Wednesday. Seriously, in, I mean, on what planet is it common sense to allow our children to be thinking that they can just swap pronouns and genders and different days of the week, for heaven's sake. We're the only party with the courage to call this out and to say that this is the greatest breach of safeguarding I think that has ever been seen in schools. I've been a governor of schools. Many of you will have been a governor of schools. You see these great safeguarding documents. This gender ideology, it is causing anxiety, stress, depression, confusion amongst our children and grandchildren it is therefore a serious breach of safeguarding. We're the only party that says it's got to stop. Every primary, every secondary school, it's got to stop. And any teacher or head teacher that allows it to carry on, you're fired. It's as simple as that. <laughs> We're also the only party talking of important culturism. It, you know, we operate under an Eng English legal system. It was pretty surprising the other day to see this Henry Jackson Society survey about attitudes from, uh, from the Muslim community, a third of whom thought that actually they wanted Sharia law in the United Kingdom. We're the only party to say that we need to legislate to ban Sharia law in the United Kingdom. <laughs> There are something like about somewhere between, I think, 50 and 100 Sharia councils currently operating across the UK. But if that's your gig, if that's what you want, Sharia law, there's plenty of other places where you can enjoy Sharia law. But we are foundation, well, our foundation is Christianity and we operate under an English legal system and we need leadership that has the courage to call it out. Some of this stuff really isn't difficult. I mean, it's common sense. The problem is common sense doesn't seem to be very common these days. Um, so in a sense, we're anxious. The emails I get every day have turned from anxiety six months ago to raw fury now. But I'm optimistic that we can turn this round. It's not easy. I guess you have to be an optimist if you go into politics. It's a pretty mad game. But we can change this. We can turn it around. The thing is, you have to be on the ballot paper to shape and influence. That's what we're going to do. I'm optimistic that we can firstly save Britain and then we can make Britain great again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, uh, Richard. Um, I, I can see there's already going to be quite a few questions. Can I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, please, to keep them brief, therefore. Um, right, if we could start with the gentleman there, and then the, this one, and then the one behind him. Yes, with the scarf. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Richard, as mentioned um, briefly outside, I'm a candidate in the upcoming elections for Reform UK. In the video hustings in our area, I've stated that I back the NCF's 10 pledges. Should we encourage all of our candidates to do the same? Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. I have to say, I mean, 
I was so delighted that Rafe, I mean, basically Rafe, he kept mentioning the word reform. And those pledges are amazing. And they're strong. And it, but it requires serious leadership in order to drive those through. And yes, the unions will get a bit excited. But this is the battleground. And this is what we've got to do. And we've got to go for it. Will you next, sir? Good morning, or good afternoon, whatever it is now. You've outlined all of your pledges, which are brilliant, and you've rung a bell with all of us here. I've got one question for you, though. How are you going to get yourself, get these pledges through when you've got to wade through the quagmire of the civil service? Yeah, yeah great question. If you heard it, it's about our friends in the civil service. And look, the reality is that the elected representatives of the country are the people who should be running the country. And the contract of those who work for the civil service is to carry out the will of the ministers. It is as simple as that. But it comes back to this word leadership, sir. Those elected representatives have to have the strength and the conviction and the principle to say, this is what we're going to do. And if you don't like it, please go and get a job elsewhere. Now, actually, I favour a slightly different system of governance where a new Secretary of State in a department, for example, could bring in 15 to 20 people yeah, yeah. from outside, from whether it's the private sector, the charitable sector, brilliant people who may well be taking a pay cut for three or four years, but it's part of your civic duty. You're going to come and help run the show. And actually, those people need to come, up, come in and help and sometimes kick some backsides. Because if we don't have the courage to do this, then we'll never get the reforms that are essential. So you're right, it's a challenge, but I still think it's doable. Uh, lady at the back there. Uh, hello, I wanted to ask you, because you're referring to strong leadership, uh, we have recently, we have seen some MPs like Mike Freer uh, stepping down due to threats they are receiving from uh, Islamist extremists. So, what you will do if you will be in a similar position, if you will have your MPs being threatened? How, how you will respond to that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. How do you respond to those threats? And, I mean, ultimately, every individual elected representative, public figure, have to make a decision for themselves and their family. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? The, I barely mentioned the religion of net zero, but I now get more abuse and vitriol because of our stance <coughs> on, on net zero and gender ideology than I got abuse on Brexit, which feels like a walk in the park. Um, so, and the reason is there's so much money involved. If you don't understand something, follow the money. Uh, but ultimately, there's two issues. One is MPs clearly need the appropriate level of protection. And the second is actually, it just requires what I mentioned, which is courage. It's not easy, but we need courageous people and all those are standing for us uh, here and around the country. I'm enormously grateful because actually it's hard. It's really hard putting your head above the parapet. Uh, someone else here uh, is about to lose their job because they've had the temerity to stand for reform. That's where we're at. That's the sort of council culture we're at. So it's not easy, but if we want to save our country, we've actually just got to have that courage. Gentlemen, right over there. Hi, Richard. Thank you for the talk today. This is a strategic question with respect to reforms, growth. I uh, took part in a local campaign on a local issue recently. And what was interesting is that it was led by someone who is expert in the science of campaigning. So it was a, a real eye-opener for me. And I spoke to him about reform and how reform translates its rising poll numbers into Westminster seats. And he explained how the Scottish National Party and the Liberal Democrats achieved that by marrying their rising poll numbers with effective professional ground campaigns. So and he also said that Brexit, the Brexit Party had not done this in the past. So my question is, in order to translate your rising poll numbers into Westminster seats, are you going to establish a professional ground campaign? Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. And look, um, the reality is, I mean, we are a very fast growing party. Three years ago, when we rebranded, we were trading at naught in the polls. The Tories laughed at me. 
Well, they're not laughing now. They're absolutely terrified. And uh, with that growth, I mean, they spend 35 million a year. We spend less than a million and a half a year. So it's not easy. Um, obviously, uh, you know, we're building up teams, but it requires our candidates to be like chief execs of their campaign in their constituency. So we're growing fast. We're doing the best we can with the resources we've got. And let's see when the general election is. But, you know, it's, it's not easy. But it comes back to that point. If you don't try, you've got absolutely no chance. The difference this time round is that the old mantra that we hear from the Tories, no one's buying it anymore. The truth is they've broken the country. Vote Tory, get failure. Vote reform, get reform. And that's the message we're pushing out. And I think that it was quite significant the other day, 12 days ago or something, Nigel, he said... Uh, at an event, he said reform could get more votes cast than the Conservative Party that won an 80-seat majority at the last election. So we're in a strange world, and we're going to do the best we can. Obviously, we should have proportional representation in this country. First past the post is, is frankly, a disaster. We share that it was not great company. Belarus is the only other country, I believe, in Europe that has this sort of electoral system. Because you end up with a situation where the Tories say, well, the opposition will be worse. What a terrible way to run a democracy. Someone else will be worse. Maybe she'd actually be saying, we'll be better. We'll be courageous. We can reform this place. That's the optimistic way of doing things. But it's not easy. You're right. And we'll do the best we can. Uh, just two more now for... Sorry, we've already... Uh, the gentleman there and then the lady behind. Yeah, the guy in the striped thing. Thank you. Um, a lot has been said at the conference today about freedom of speech and cancel culture. I noticed in the last two months, the um, left-wing group Hope Not Hate has accused a lot of your candidates of offensive statements, and your response, I believe, has been to deselect about half a dozen of your own candidates. So I was wondering, how are you going to stand up to cancel culture if you're seemingly prepared to cancel several of your own supporters, candidates, activists, for exercising their freedom? That's a great question. Um, it's a great question. So, but there's a key difference, isn't there? Because freedom of speech, freedom of expression, of expression, is one thing. But that's actually very different if you want to stand as an elected representative of a political party. So what we say is, look, you can have your freedom of speech, but if you want to stand for us as a political party, then actually you've got to behave in an appropriate way for an elected representative. And we've defended many candidates against ridiculous accusations. I mean, one of them apparently was a bad thing because they were a fortune teller. I tell you what, I think every party should have a fortune teller. <laughs> I mean, frankly, I think our fortune teller is probably better than the wallies in the treasury in their forecasts or the office for incompetent forecasting. So, uh, you know, frankly, I think that's a, a good thing. Um, but what we can't tolerate is racism, inappropriate behaviour, that's the difference between freedom of speech, which is sacrosanct, but if you want to stand as an elected representative, that's a different thing. That's why we made the decisions. It's interesting with Hope Not Hate. I mean, they are a vile organisation. And for those of you who think we're a controlled opposition and that I'm in their pay or their pocket, grow up. I've attacked them because it's interesting. They never seem to find the anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. They never seem to find the anti-Semitism in George Galloway's Workers' Party. Funny that. I mean, I thought they were diligent and they were trying to sort of create community harmony. <coughs> we know where they're at, um, but that's the reality. I say to our candidates, you know, this is a serious, serious job. We're trying to reform the way the country's run. We're a serious political party. And frankly, it's not a game. Uh, this final question was the lady behind... Uh, is she, there she is. I'd just like to say that my worries are the, the Human Rights Bill. Over and over again, it's always put a stop to certain movements and it just doesn't seem to go anywhere. And it's just this frustration that nothing seems to change. And it seems outdated, very outdated, the way these sort of always come up with excuses but they can't do this or they can't do that, but never really any foundation to it at all. And it just gets no, no better at all. Great question about the, the, the Human Rights Act, and, and I should have mentioned it earlier, but of course, one of the reasons for that is that 
it's ultimately basically a replica of the European Convention on Human Rights. And if you're going to do a job, do it properly. If we're going to do Brexit, let's do it properly in multiple ways. I've touched on some of them. But actually, the final thing we need to do is to leave the auspices, auspices of this foreign court, the ECHR. And we're the only political party that has the courage to stand on that basis. And, and actually, it's more than that. The 2010 Equalities Act, well-intentioned, but actually it's ended up being a disaster. And this expression, DEI, diversity, equality and inclusion, is leading to a downward spiral towards mediocrity. It's positive discrimination against those who are the best for a particular job. It's catastrophic for productivity. It's catastrophic for growth. You've got to start again and completely scrap it. Richard, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Richard Tice. Thank you. Hey, Richard. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you. Thank you.